the Irish nationals, they were still terrorists, basically. And then there was the vast majority, like Jerry Adams or political wing, that had accepted and sort of gradually moderated. But we sort of have been through that process with the PLO to, to a degree. Um, you know, I, I guess I would just point out that this was that, that Hamas were the rejectionists during the peace process and that this was supposed to be, you know, that we were supposed to sort of, you're always going to have these rejectionists. You know what I'm saying? And now the sure. rejectionists are the new IRA and you sort of, and I, so I, I find that that view is somewhat problematic. And I think including Hamas, I think the other thing I would say is this. I don't think that, I think that it was wrong to allow Hamas to participate politically while they were still an armed militia and still devoted to terrorism. So, and I think that that's a consistent position with the Bush democracy agenda, too. But once you... But you would have allowed Fatah to run. Well, I'm saying that, well, Fatah, though, was in... Well, Fatah, though, the preventive security services were part of the state that was being built up. They were, like, I guess you could say legitimate guns. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to illegitimate guns. But the... the, the I would say is akin to sort of the, the push to try to include Hamas in a unity government was like the failed efforts to include Muqtada al-Sadr in the Iraqi governments. It's a good thing that Sadr was eventually excised from the Maliki government, because that gave Maliki the political space and ultimately legitimacy with other Sunni Iraqis to take on the irredentist terrorists uh, on the Shia side who were who liked Sadr's minions, or elements of Sadr's minions, I suppose, that were terrorizing regular Iraqis. And so the, 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 I think that it would, I just think that that's a dangerous position to be in uh, where you, you, you favor this kind of unity government with people who seem to have interest only in unity on their very narrow terms. Well, I guess I would just say that I, I, I think that, you know, there were a bunch of statements from Hamas uh, leaders basically suggesting that they were that they would have been open to various things like a long term ceasefire. I don't I agree. I don't think that would be true for all of Hamas. But I think that it was essentially only by giving Hamas more of an opportunity to participate in the political process that I think you potentially have the split kind of within the Palestinian rejectionist camp that leads to the true rejectionists being more marginalized and that others in Hamas actually becoming more invested. In the, in, the, in the political process. You know, can we guarantee that would have worked? No, we can't guarantee that would have worked. But again, I, I, I think that um, when you look back at it from the perspective of what happened in the Gaza war and, and, and how terrible the, the, this path has turned out for both the people of Gaza and the people of Starot, I think I would I think at least you at least have to ask, was was could more have an effort been made, in fact, to find a way of dealing with this Hamas problem? And I agree with the problem politically rather than militarily. I think there was at the very least a real lack of, of creativity on both the Israeli and the American side. Okay, okay. Well, let's, I, that's a good place to leave it. We have in our last third of the dialogue here sure. an opportunity to talk about really the, what finally is the central thesis of your essay, which is the failure in your view of the Jewish institutions. And why don't you talk about that? That seems to me sort of restate the thesis and then let's, let's just get into that. Well, I think um, there are some differences between the different communal Jewish organizations, but by and large, I, uh, they, they tend to avoid public criticism of the Israeli government. And I think um, that kind of un- publicly uncritical Zionism does not accord with the values of, of most particularly younger secular American Jews, given their own experience. Uh, and I think it's part of the reason, not the only reason, but I think it's one reason that you're seeing such a kind of collapse in, in, in Zionism amongst younger secular Jews who are the large majority. And, and so I, I think what I would like is for the Jewish organizations like APAC and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations to take their own rhetoric more seriously about how they, I mean, they say that they admire Israel not only because it's a Jewish state, but because it's a liberal, democratic Jewish state that respects human rights and free speech uh, and desires peace and, and is open to territorial withdrawal. And I think if they really believe that, then they should ally themselves with those people in Israel who genuinely hold those values and be willing to be publicly critical of those, even those in the government who don't. Well, I mean... I think there are a couple of problems with that. One is that it's, you know, the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations, APAC, the ADL, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress. These are membership-based organizations. They're totally voluntary, and they're, uh, at least I checked this with APAC uh, before I did this, but APAC claims its membership and in, in every respect is, is going through the roof. So I think that there's, there's an interesting thing that I wanted to kind of point out, which is that you can take an opinion poll of young American Jews, 
but really there's a there's a small minority, a slice of that. Uh, broader pictures. Five million Jews in the United States. There's 100,000 official members of APAC. Uh, and if you add up all the other groups, it's maybe more. So you're talking about a percentage of a percentage. And these are the people who are going to be politically active. Now, I mean, certainly there is a kind of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, neo-progressive group in general that has been more critical of Israel. And there are a lot of Jews who find themselves politically in that camp. And, you know, it's good now that there are organizations as there kind of always have been, Peter, for more, you know, progressive, neo-progressive Jews. In this case, it would be J Street for this generation, but there was the Israel po- Policy Forum, there was Gray Ra. There have sure, always sure, sure. been these sure. these sort of more, and there's just as there for more conservative uh, Zionists sure. and Jews, there's the Zionist sure. Organization of America. Sure. And sure. those groups will criticize Israeli governments when they don't hew politically to kind of where they want to be. APAC in particular is really there to support the U.S.-Israel relationship. And I think it does a lot more almost behind the scenes in the, in the maintenance of that relationship both ways. It's a portal to both governments. For example, in the 1990s, in the last decade, there was a tremendous amount of concern and frustration from the U.S. defense establishment that its partner in uh, the defense industries in Israel were also selling sensitive radar plane known as the Falcon to the Chinese to the Chinese and the, the People's Liberation Army there. And so their APAC, I think I know this for fact, played a small but important behind-the-scenes role of telling the Israelis that they really needed to cut this sort of thing out. And in, in exchange in the, in the past, of course, APAC has delivered discrete messages to the U.S. side of things. And there's a series of things that, the, that APAC does. So I guess it just, in that sense, I think, I don't think it's APAC's job. APAC's job is to support. And when there were peace process governments, by the way, uh, in Israel... Uh, you had none other than Steve Rosen going to the Heritage Foundation in 1993 with every conservative group in town and saying, listen, we're going to go for a peace process. I know that we haven't done that before, but this is the new way it's going to be. And there, and APAC was criticized from the right in the 1990s of uh, failing to account for, you know, the delicate sensibilities of conservatives in this process. So. I think that it's just in the APAC's case, it's okay. really not their job. Okay, well, let, let me just respond to that to, 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 right. to, to that point. You're absolutely right that APAC's you know, public position is they don't cr- criticize the Israeli government, publicly criticize any Israeli government. As I said, I, I disagree with that. I think that violates APAC's own stated principles about what it admires in Israel. I also think that it, the, the history of the 1990s shows, in fact, uh, that APAC, um, uh, although it publicly supported um, you know, Robin during during the peace process. Robin, as you know, was absolutely furious with, b- because he believed that APAC was going behind his back and encouraging Congress to do things that pass pass resolutions that would, in fact, make it much more difficult for him to uh, to continue the peace process. And that's why he he helped to create Israel Policy Forum. So, there, there, although APAC publicly was supportive of the peace process, eight powerful APAC board members were actually walking the halls of Congress. Uh, this has been described, I think, in J.J. Goldberg's book, Jewish Power and Other Places, basically in opposition to the Robin government and, and, and the peace process. Um, so, you know, APAC, it's not that I don't think that a group like APAC can survive. What I was suggesting is that if you look at where I think they're going to get most of their members in the coming generations, I think it's going to be a group that has a larger and larger percent of Orthodox Jews in it, uh, and that's because Orthodox Jews tend to be in the younger generation much more committed to Israel, but also much less liberal in their vision of Israel. And I think my prediction, it's just a prediction, but that, that is actually going to mean that, a, that, that APAC's willingness, APAC's willingness to criticize the Israeli governments from the right, its, its identity as more of a right-wing organization, is going to increase in the coming years. I mean, already Robin was furious at the way it handled, handled itself in the 1990s on the, under the peace process. I'm afraid that APAC in fact is going to become more like the ZOA in the coming years. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I think that it, it's, it's a very different organization than ZOA, and, uh, you know, it's possible that I mean, there will be more, of a, Go ahead. There'll be more of, a, of a kind of fractalization. But I want to kind of get to something else, which is about this, this notion, and I see it, you know, kind of, if you read Spencer Ackerman's blog, he sometimes does this annoying thing where he addresses <laughs> the left side of the shuttle and the right side of the shuttle. And, I mean, here's my view. Um, it's interesting that you have a few bloggers who have become interested in recent years about Israel and a few people like Jeremy ben Ami and other people that kind of come from the But it's really like the, the kind of intellectual history of this stuff is it's I don't I just think it's like it's not particularly 
within the realms of Zionism, to be perfect, real talk right here, Peter, you have, you know, a kind of net left movement or neo-progressive movement in this country coming up during Bush that believed at first that the Israel lobby had, you know, helped manipulate intelligence to get to force America to launch the Iraq war. And I know you're not saying that you didn't get into that, but that is a very prevalent view of, you know, in fact, I wrote, I wrote an entire column saying that I think actually, you know, that, it, that, that the Afghan, that the fact that the same group people supported. And yeah, no, I mean, I don't believe that. I've actually written publicly about no, that. No, I, so. I, I, that's why I said, I don't, I'm not subscribing it to you. Okay. But you have this kind of, you know, you have an interest in the Israel lobby on what might be, for lack of a better word, the net left, okay, the yeah. internet bloggers, and they, they say all kinds of stuff about it, and they, they like to pop up their chest and say that, you know, listen, I'm against it and so forth. But I wonder if that translates into building a real organization with real Americans, most of them Jewish, coming to Washington who are activists who follow these issues, and that is what APAC currently has. And I wonder that if APAC was to take the sensibilities of a Matthew Iglesias more seriously, which it obviously, which, you know, it doesn't right now, if it would, is, is there like some membership that it would be attracting? Would it make it? I mean, I just wonder like why it should listen to that. I mean, like who, you know, it seems like, it seems to me at least that Matthew Iglesias and a lot of the people on the net left are beyond simply saying we're liberal Zionists. They're hostile in a lot of ways to Israel. They tend to um, never give Israel the benefit of the doubt. They tend to exaggerate Israel's flaws and faults, and they, they, they tend to ignore other factors in the Palestinians, and it's part of a sort of narrative to defame and delegitimize Israel that it's just, in my, in, in my estimation, it doesn't really hew to reality, and it's not so much a reflection of liberal or conservative Zionism as much as it is almost post-Zionism. Right. Well, you know? there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot you said there. Let me, let okay. me I, you know, right. I, I, um, I, I've gone to speak at, I, you know, I used to give speeches right. for APAC, so I've probably gone to dozens of APAC chapters. And, and what you tend to find across the country, well, you know, what you tend to find is that the people who go to these events are kind of pillar of the community types, you know, the same kind of right. people who go to federation dinners, so that kind of thing. Um, they, they, as I said in my piece, I think they tend to be what I would call them Hubert Humphrey Democrats. They're kind of moderate Democrats, by and large. Um, liberal on a lot of stuff, but they kind of carve out an exception in a way. They're more hawkish on Israel than they are on almost anything else. I think that's a very particular identity that emerged at a moment in time, particularly by people, as I said in the piece, who were shaped in this extraordinary period of starting before the 67 war and leading up through the Zionism equals racism resolution after the Yom Kippur war. I think what is striking is that that particular identity constellation, I think, is not really translating to these people's kids and grandkids. And I think the, you know, the, you know, there's, oh, you're right. There are, there are intellectuals are all always a small number compared to larger groups, yeah. but intellectuals also, you know, they also have an influence on groups. And I think what's really striking to me is that if you look at prominent younger liberal bloggers, I can't think of a single one who is basically a liberal on most things but carves out an exception for Israel. They don't carve out an exception. This, this carving out an exception, I think, is that I think what you're finding is the people who basically don't criticize Israel are also people who are more hawkish and to the right on other things as well. And given that I think American Jewry is likely to remain in general on the left, for a long time, I think what you're going to find is those traditional members of APAC are going to start, are, are going to basically, they're going to die off. And the question is, I think, what we should be doing is cultivating people. I mean, I think Jewish organizations should be cultivating people like Matthew Iglesias, who 